Dimitri, we had fun with talk about the memory vapor. <laughs> so after the memory of water, the memory of vapor. Bonjour. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, Anik and Roger for contriving such an imaginative and inspiring uh, symposium. And I'd like to apologize uh, that my collaborator, Vilima Domnich, was not able to join us today due to um, various simultaneities. Uh, although we are quite familiar with the effects of solar radiation on our biosphere and atmosphere, as in well, the case of Aurora Borealis or Australis, in this image here, uh, the effects of extrasolar radiation are far less sensorially or even theoretically familiar. At this very moment, we are being bombarded by a voracious zoo of uh, charge carriers coming from every possible direction in outer space. Uh, the immense variety of, of particle energies reflects the diversity of cosmic sources and the origins range from processes on the sun and on other stars to hitherto uncharted physical mechanisms in the furthest quadrants of the perceivable universe. There is evidence that uh, that these these highest, uh, th th these particles with the highest energy, the fastest moving particles, are coming from uh, active black holes and supernovas. And uh, one such source, for example, is the Crab Nebula, which is a remnant of uh, supernova 1054, which in that year, sorry about that, in that year, uh, it was documented by uh, Arab and Chinese uh, sources that for 23 days uh, there was a light source uh, that one could see uh, during broad daylight. Uh, and so, yes, there, none, nonetheless, even such powerful explosions perhaps are not enough to, to, to explain these uh, these cosmic bullets, some of which are uh, thousands of times faster than the ones that are produced in the Large Hadron Collider and others that come about once a year that are uh, millions of times, tens of millions of times more powerful. So uh, one way in which uh, these cosmic rays can reach the senses is by means of an experimental environment known as a, as a cloud chamber, which was initially invented by Charles Wilson in 1894, perfected much later in 1911, to study the nucleation of atmospheric clouds, an idea that came to Wilson uh, during his mountaineering trips when he observed such phenomena as uh, auroras and, and glories. It's important to note that uh, these, these cosmic rays, uh, as soon as they hit the upper layer of the Earth's atmosphere, the ionosphere, they uh, break up into many, many more particles, into billions of other particles, which then uh, we can observe here uh, on Earth. But um, it was believed, uh, actually just a, a few years after Wilson um, invented the clown chamber, it was believed that these, uh, that most of the radiation in the air is actually coming from the earth, from radioactive substances in the earth. And uh, only in, uh, by 1911 did uh, Victor Hess uh, conduct an experiment where 5,000 meters uh, above sea level, it was understood that the ionization rate was about uh, fourfold that um, at, at ground level. So it was obvious, and it was made especially obvious when he conducted these same measurements during a nearly uh, total solar eclipse, that this energy was coming from uh, way beyond the solar system. In uh, 1925, uh, 
Robert Millican, who had used uh, a cloud chamber, a Wilson chamber, to, uh, to measure the precise charge of a single electron, went on to measure the charge of, this, uh, of, of, of many of these other particles coming from different regions of outer space. And uh, it was then that he uh, coined the term cosmic rays, which is what they are called now. Uh, he also uh, believed that, uh, in, f in fact, this is one of the reasons why he called them cosmic rays, is that he did not believe that they were particles, but rather very powerful um, photonic impulses. And he, uh, in, in fact, after calling them cosmic uh, rays, he went on to call them God particles because he believed that they were the birth cries of new atoms continuously being created by God to counteract the entro uh, uh, to counteract entropy and prevent the heat death of the universe. And his uh, scientific career came to an accelerated end at that point. Um, in, in this artwork uh, called uh, Memory Vapor, we create a, a cloud chamber particle accelerator that is uh, enhanced by the fact that there's a uh, there is both a spatial and temporal uh, extension of observability because there's, there's a, a white laser sheet that behaves in a rather strange way when it encounters uh, these water droplets. So I'm going to, to, to jump back to an earlier project uh, which uh, somehow informed this one. Evelyn and I were uh, levitating uh, acoustically uh, droplets of oil and we found that we came across this uh, amazing uh, discovery that uh, when a laser beam uh, enters a, uh, an optimally spherical floating droplet or bubble, uh, it, it can get trapped in that bubble. It can get sucked into that bubble as if into a waveguide antenna and the, the frequency can, can be modulated as such and also the, uh, the, the intensity of the light can increase quite significantly. And this has to do with something that perhaps we're more familiar with acoustically. Uh, whispering chamber modes occur uh, in various medieval architecture, for example, where you can hear people whispering from very, very far away as if they're whispering di directly into your ear. And this has to do with the fact that the, the sound does not lose any of its intensity as it moves across this, this very clean parabola. And in that same way, when the light enters a, 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 a optimum spherical, once again, uh, bubble or droplet, it, it begins to, to uh, it gets trapped, it begins to race around it, and as such it becomes a, an, an optical resonator, just like a lasing cavity. Uh, I guess it's also important to note that because it is a, it is a white laser, uh, you, you have this kind of prismatic depth perception that, that arises. And uh, so you, you, can, you can better distinguish what is happening in very, very small quadrants of space because of the fact that, uh, that these quadrants of space uh, are uh, glowing in different colors. I'm going to watch a brief uh, video bit. Ah, the sound is... Ah. Thanks to uh, the cloud project conducted at CERN and to parallel research conducted at the uh, Lebedev Institute uh, in, in Moscow, 
We now know that uh, cosmic rays are uh, a quintessential part of a variety of uh, processes here on Earth, uh, from tree growth to, uh, to even lightning, for example. It is, uh, it, it is presumed that lightning uh, can actually be seeded by this uh, this vacuum, which is actually a plenum, a, a big zoo of particles uh, that are interacting with uh, with the molecules in the air, it is something that is uh, that has been called uh, relativistic runaway electron avalanche. And uh, this this was actually this is a precursor to to, to memory vapor, a work that also. Um, uses this technique of a uh, white laser sheet that uh, illuminates, in this case, a uh, clouds of hydrogen bubbles in water. Uh, when, when the Earth's aqueous envelope is uh, irradiated by sunlight, uh, sunlight imparts electromagnetic fields. This is going back to, to uh, what Victoria was talking about in the memory of water. These electromagnetic fields, they don't uh, just simply enter the water and leave it. Uh, some of them can stay in the water for weeks on end. And when this takes place, the, the uh, water begins to divide into its uh, constituent uh, hydrogen and, and oxygen uh, ingredients. And uh, th this, the, the, the oxygen, uh, leaves the water uh, rather quickly and uh, for forms, uh, I mean, it, it, it goes into our atmosphere, whereas actually most of the hydrogen, which is the main source of hydrogen uh, on Earth, uh, or should I say the main source of earthly hydrogen, not to count the hydrogen coming from outer space, uh, yeah, that helically conjoins every strand of DNA that, that becomes the, the, the the bonding element of, of all living matter. So th this this process, um, well, we'll pass that. Uh, it's it's something that uh, is of course an, an extraordinary energy source, and this is uh, being um, divulged more and more in in, in recent years. Uh, there's there's a lot of research in uh, artificial photosynthesis. And in fact, uh, one, one of the next stages of, of, of this work, hydrogeny, uh, involves uh, the research of a biophysicist at the, at the Freie Universität in, in Amsterdam, uh, which uh, allows an almost lossless translation of uh, sunlight into biosolar fuel. And so uh, we have uh, in the works, a, a version of, the, of, of hydrogeny that will uh, work, that will essentially be completely uh, autonomous. That the uh, the energy fueling the the electrolysis, uh, uh, the, the, the the water splitting, um, and and for that matter, even the white laser sheet will come completely from the the hydrogen that is created by the artwork itself. Uh, in fact, the very very first artwork that Avidia and I ever uh, exhibited uh, has to do with uh, with water vapor clouds that are illuminated uh, by uh, highly focused uh, light source. In fact, the light source had to be so well focused that it, otherwise this dispersed uh, water vapor produced by electrolysis, just like in the experiments of, uh, of of Thompson at Cavendish and and of uh, Robert Millikan when he was uh, trying to determine the exact charge of an electron. Uh, this this water vapor is also produced by electrolysis, and you could you could not see it uh, in this kind of light, or for that matter, in a very bright light. Only in total darkness with a very very uh, very hi highly focused, and only from a very specific angle. Uh, some years later, uh, Evelina and I began to explore kind of a diametrically opposite situation. Uh, 
clouds of air bubbles, if you will, that emit light in, in water. A still not fully explainable phenomenon known as sonoluminescence. Uh, this is something that takes place when high frequency uh, sound waves penetrate uh, water or other liquids that have micro bubbles of gas in them. In fact, I, I have to say that although we exhibit this work using uh, water uh, and, and, and simply the air that is naturally dissolved therein, in this case, we're looking at uh, sulfuric acid that is infused with xenon gas because that's the only way that you can get a good photograph of it. It was a bit dangerous actually to do so because we had to fill a rather large chamber about this size um, with sulfuric acid. But <laughs> um, for the public, we, we, sh we show it in water and actually it takes about uh, five minutes for one to adapt to total darkness, and then you begin to see the configurations of these glowing sound fields. Uh, the, what happens is that if you imagine uh, sound waves in three dimensions, the, uh, the, the antinode of the sound wave, the value, if you will, is a pocket of empty space. And if this pocket is small enough, in other words, if the frequency of the sound is high enough, the wavelength short enough, these pockets of empty space can, can fit into these, uh, these micro bubbles that are uh, of, of, of gas that, that are naturally in the liquid or infused in the liquid. And they, as soon as that, that, that semi-vacuum enters the bubble skin, it implodes and, uh, at about 10 times the speed of sound. When this happens, the, the, the gas, its gaseous innards become so dense that it reaches temperatures as high as are found on the sun, at least in the realm of 10,000 degrees Celsius and perhaps much more. Um, the, the thing is that because the flash of light is very brief, it lasts much less than a billionth of a second, it is not possible to, 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 to ascertain the exact temperature. But in recent years, it was determined that um, it, it is not possible to, uh, to attain nuclear fusion by this means. And this, this is what uh, created a lot of stir in, in, the, uh, in the physics communities with regard to sound and luminescence. And as soon as it was understood that no, there are no neutrons being produced, uh, it was uh, almost completely abandoned. But uh, there's, there's a bright side to that story that I'll, I'll, I'll tell in a moment. So we can watch a uh, brief video of this as well. Let's see. So when, when Evelina and I uh, started working on this project, in fact, we were told that we were, by, by pioneers in the field of sonoluminescence, that we were wasting our time, that we would never be able to uh, observe sonoluminescence at the scale that we had envisioned. And thankfully, uh, we trusted our intuition and, 
and 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 pursued this 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 project and uh, in 2003 we found ourselves at uh, an international conference on sano chemistry in Japan and there uh, we met uh, because most of the lectures were were in Japanese uh, we, we, we we had the pleasure of meeting the, the director of the then director of the uh, the physics institute of Göttingen University uh, among the birthplaces of quantum physics and uh, Werner Lauterborn uh, was was actually the first person who believed that perhaps it could be done because the thing is that most people who were looking uh, at uh, sound of luminescence were looking at, at single bubbles or one way or the other they were looking at the phenomenon in, 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 in a tiny cuvette and, and, and it just didn't, uh, didn't occur to them that it could be upscaled and of course in order to do so um, Evelina and I had to had to collaborate with with a, a vast variety of scientists and engineers to to uh, to, to create uh, the proper uh, there is a certain limit known as the Curie limit as far as um, high frequency uh, transduction is concerned. If the transducer uh, is pushed with too much uh, voltage, the uh, it will overheat. And then it will no longer transduce, and this is known as the Curie limit. And we were kind of working at the Curie limit to create to create a, a very large volume of of, of uh, sonoluminescent water. But uh, thankfully, we once again we we trusted our instincts, and we went on with the project, and uh, we we, were, we created many prototypes. Over, overall, it was about a uh, a six-year engagement. And uh, besides ourselves, um, the, there was <laughs> there were a few other scientists that we had uh, collaborated with that continued on with their uh, research of, of, of sound luminescence, in spite of the fact that all of the funding had uh, evaporated. And uh, yes, one of them was Shinichi Hatanaka, who uh, is at the University of Tokyo. He. Uh, just very recently discovered uh, two-colored sound luminescence, which is absolutely spectacular, not only because of uh, this kind of color depth that allows you to look more deeply into the sound, but also because the colors occur in different parts of, 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 the, of the sound wave. Uh, you, you get this kind of, uh, a similar kind of uh, bluish white, which is the xenon gas, and then you get this, this uh, rusty orange. Uh, occupying a different a different section of, of, of the sound field. Well, I'd like to conclude with the words of uh, one of my favorite uh, theoretical physicists and philosophers, so eloquently emphasizing the the senses and and the inner senses as the optimal instruments for discovering hidden frontiers. Structure Synergetica in a few words. Where, when, how? Oh, yes, yes, sure, sure. Uh, Synergetica is a uh, is a laboratory for immersive art science uh, based in Amsterdam, and uh, we we conduct uh, in addition to art projects, we have a, a variety of public events where both artists and scientists are invited to um, engage in discussions and. Uh, uh, present, be it artworks, be it live experiments. Okay, so let's have a break. Two-person structure. No, no, no. Quite. It's it's uh, there. There, uh, there are a few people uh, that, that that should we say more than two <laughs> that, that that determine the structure, but. Uh, there are many more, uh, in fact, teams of individuals, uh, uh, both in the Netherlands and, and, and throughout uh, Europe. Okay, so 
space? Yes, yes, yes. In Amsterdam. In Amsterdam, right next to Central Station. <laughs> Convenient. Yes. <laughs>